those kind of, you know, that kind of stuff that, that no one could do. Uh -huh. Cool stuff. Yeah. <laughs> All right, here it is, uh, flashback episode number three of Let There Be Talk, and today we continue the ACDC theme going back to October 22nd, 2020. Many years ago, I sat down with the very, very low-key and uh, amazing bass player, Mr. Cliff Williams, who recently retired from ACDC, he will not be touring anymore, but I uh, wanted to say thank you to Cliff Williams, you know? I think most people were more concerned who the new bass player was and not concerned with Cliff Williams being gone, which I thought was an absolute travesty. I think that most people don't know who Cliff Williams is that listened to Shook Me All Night Long or whatever, but to me, Cliff Williams was the heart and soul of the rhythm back there with Phil Rudd and a huge, huge factor in ACDC's success. Being a team player, which is very hard to find, somebody that looked great, kept himself fit, no drama, no drug overdoses, nothing. Just sat back there, laid down the four string groove uh, ever since 1977, he joined right after the Let the Be Rock record. He played on some of the most iconic ACDC records ever, including Power Age, which most people consider ACDC's best record. That was his first record that he recorded joining the band. I saw Cliff Williams in 1978, and I loved him ever since. His look and vibe is insane. The way him and Malcolm would walk up to the mic perfectly in sync lay down those background vocals he sat back there with those amps on 110 db and those cannons blasting over his head and you know i gotta say it right now i salute you mr clip williams you are one of the greats one of the most underrated soldiers of rock and uh i thank you from the bottom of my heart for being part of one of the greatest bands of all time and enjoy your retirement. That is something 99.9% .9 of musicians do not do. They do not retire. So mad respect to you wherever you're at. Enjoy your life, man. And I hope I get to uh, run into you one day and meet you in person again. So here it is. Sit back everybody and enjoy uh, flashback Let There Be Talk number three. And everybody, show your love for the great Cliff Williams. Have a great weekend, everybody. Subscribe to the podcast on YouTube and leave a review on iTunes. And come see me this weekend at uh, the Comedy Fort in Fort Collins, Colorado, or next weekend at Acme Comedy Co. in Minneapolis or the following weekend in St. Louis. I'm out there. I'm touring. I love all you guys. Candles are lit. All right, here it is Thursday, October 22nd, and I'm continuing on with my ACDC week. That is right. It is another fantastic member of the band, Mr. Cliff Williams. I've been wanting to talk to this man for many, many years. And I will tell you something right now. When you look at a fantastic rock and roll band, there is one thing that takes that band to the next level, and that is definitely chemistry. And by the time Cliff Williams gets into ACDC for the Let There Be Rock tour, the chemistry that starts to happen between these five men is so monumental and unbelievable and carried on to all the way to right now, all these years later, that has been the, uh, the secret of ACDC, chemistry.
chemistry and of course incredible songs a kick-ass logo an insane live show it's it's numerous things but the first thing the first thing the nucleus of a crushing rock band is chemistry everyone i've ever interviewed on here always says the same thing such and such came in the group such and such happened and then boom chemistry magic and you cannot explain the magic around acdc i was talking to my buddy billy Rowe today and you just cannot explain it it was just meant to be and it will probably a hundred percent never happen again in this way and one of the key ingredients is the rhythm section of acdc phil rudd and cliff williams and malcolm the three back there just laying down the foundation for bond or brian and angus to just completely ignite it is it is an honor to have this man on and you know how i love to have the uh members of the band uh on the show that don't get interviewed that often i find these people completely interesting and and just as important as the star front man or the star lead player i've had numerous drummers on over the years and numerous bass players and I love getting into their heads and finding out what that was all about, you know, how they got into it. Before I bring Cliff on, I want to say this, and it is very, very uh, important for me to say, I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart to everyone, the thousands of people that reached out to me on Instagram email, uh, Twitter, everything, and said that this was a fantastic Brian Johnson and, and Angus Young interview. You know, the internet can be a brutal, brutal place. It is a cesspool of uh, garbage out there a lot of times, and it is a real strange world of trolling. And I was talking to my buddy Jay over at Columbia Records. And we were both very, very uh, happy to see that there was nothing, nothing but positive comments on the YouTube episode. It's, it's very rare to see that. And it, fe it, it felt so good because let me tell you, not only did i want the band to enjoy the interview and myself but i wanted all the super fans out there like myself to be like shit this is great i didn't want to let you guys down the fans and i'm not trying to be corny i'm just saying i know what this band means to you because that's what it means to me and i didn't want to let anyone down like oh man with a fucking interview, man, what the fuck? So I just want to say thank you to all of you, all of the new uh, fans that are listening to this and all of the old school Dell Razors that have been with me for the last nine years. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Real quick, Power Up comes out November 13th on Columbia Records. And I cannot wait for you guys to hear this. It is an unreal record. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Also, real quick, I'm doing some stand-up comedy this week, and if you are in San Diego, and if you are new here, I am a comedian. For the last 10 years, I've done almost 5,000 shows, and since COVID hit, I have not worked in seven months except for maybe about five or six shows. So I am finally slowly 
trying to get back into the grind. And I will be out in San Diego this weekend with my good friend Ian Edwards. And we are at the Grand Comedy Club. Two shows each night, 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. And go to grandcomedyclub.com and get your tickets. Escondido, California, which is in the San Diego area. Looking forward to seeing you guys out there. Also, if you are a musician or an athlete or just a uh, couch potato and you've got some joint ache, some aches and pains, maybe a little anxiety from the COVID, all of that stuff, my sponsor today is CBD Lime. And I've been using this stuff for about a year and it helps me with everything. My neck aches, my... uh, my knee aches, my anxiety, my lack of uh, able to sleep, all of that stuff. CBD Lion, 100% pure, clean CBD. None of that truck stop garbage. This is family owned, super clean, amazing CBD. Use the code DEAN at checkout. It's cbdlion.com. Use the code DEAN at checkout. All your favorite CBD items like tinctures, hemp flower, uh, topical lotions. That's what I use. The gummies. They even have stuff for your pet. If you got the lunatic pet that's always barking or maybe you got a pet that has some uh, old arthritis or whatever, get them some CBD lion. Use the code DEAN. It's going to get you 20% off. Do not sleep. They even got bath bombs. All right. Here we go, man. This, is, this was a, a, an honor to talk to him, Mr. Cliff Williams. It was just, what a, we, we cover it all, man. This guy has been playing the four strings for almost his entire life. Let's keep the candles lit. And uh, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel or leave a review on iTunes. Trying to get to 2,000 reviews. Here we go. Mr. Cliff Williams. Oh, man. Here we are. Continuing the ACDC week on uh, my podcast, Let There Be Talk. Fantastic guest, Mr. Cliff Williams. How are you, buddy? Doing great, man. Thank you. Doing great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just uh, waiting for all this stuff to get behind us so we can get on with our damn lives, you know. But hey. Where are you? In um, North Carolina or something? Yeah. I'm in, up in the mountains in North Carolina. Wow. Now, you live you live in Florida and North Carolina? Yeah. I kind of split the time. Ah, that's cool. Yeah. I'm waiting for it to cool down down there and I'll go down there when it's getting very cold up here, so. <laughs> snowbird style exactly <laughs> i've been uh i've been dying to talk to you for years because i i uh i'm a huge acdc fan of course but i also just have been fascinated about all things cliff williams and phil rudd for years one of the greatest rhythm uh combos in the entire history of rock man well thank you very much Adina. And it, it was really, uh, it's really wild because uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about before your ACDC ride, uh, you were out there playing bass uh, in numerous bands, and then you join a band called Home, and uh, and and that, get a record deal, and, and that's riding for a while, right? That, that's, uh, yeah, that was um, myself and uh, Laurie Wisefield, a guitar player, uh, who ended up in Wishbone and Ash, a couple of other, Mick Cook and Mick Stubbs who unfortunately are no, no longer with us. But uh, we put that together around about 69, 70, and got a, a deal with CBS Records. We had three hours. We had four. We, we recorded four, three escapes, but the uh, the last one didn't, uh, and, and the band broke up after that, about 73, something like that, 74. And you guys opened for, some, like, Zeppelin in the faces and stuff, right? Yeah, uh, we did. Uh, the Zeppelin gig was interesting. Uh, on the bill was Stone the Crows as well, uh, who were a great band of their da- in their day. Uh, faces were fantastic. We, we played a show with them in Berlin, and that was before the war came. There was a 100-mile corridor you drive through, and it was thick snow. And we were all in a – we had a transit van, two transit vans, one for gear and one for us. The gear transit van went off the road, 
lost all the equipment. We made it to the gig and the faces said, use our gear. I mean, thank you very much, guys. That was awesome. Wow. Wow. That, I mean, those, those are some epic bands to be out playing with, like the faces and Zeppelin. What was the Zeppelin um, era? Was the first record or the second? Well, it was, let's see, it would have been, I think it might have been the first one. I'm not too sure now. Well, yeah, yeah, man. That's, I mean, that's, that's, that's a brutal, a brutal band right there to open for, yeah. right? They just come out, take no prisoners. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. They were, they were pretty amazing in the day. Now, who was it for you that got you into the bass? Uh, was it the Beatles? Were you watching stuff on TV? How do you get in there? I, I got into, yeah, obviously the Beatles were, uh, and the Stones and the Kinks and all that, uh, you know, in the early 60s uh, uh, got my attention. But um, I, it was, I, I mentioned this the other day to, to an, uh, in an interview. It's like when I was really little and I hadn't started playing, I was probably 12 or so. When I was walking past, a, a, it would have been like a youth club or something like that, and there was music playing. It was in the afternoon. Uh, and there was it was like stacks and Tamla Motown stuff coming out of there, and of course, bass you know uh, sticks right out and goes through walls and stuff like that, and it stopped me in my tracks. I was literally outside the building just listening to the bass lines. It was probably James Jameson or someone, you know, and it really got my attention. So uh, I kind of I guess that put the seed in me. Did you start uh, by playing uh, with fingers, or were you always a pick guy? Uh, God, I think I don't think I knew what a pick was in those days. Uh, I was I started on six string. My 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 folks had got me an acoustic guitar, and then this uh, this band, a school band, they had two guitars, drums, singer, needed a bass player. So God bless them, my folks got me this bass. I think it was fingers to start with. I mean, uh, because your style is so distinctive in ACDC with the picking. ACDC always had that kind of bass, rolling bass thing going, you know? Yeah, and, and the pick gives, gives me a lot of attack. It, be, keep it tight. Sorry, you just get it punchy. Fingers, me really gets a little loose now. When you're, when you're playing the ACDC songs, I, I know because once a year uh, I do a tribute to Bon Scott and we, uh, we do all these songs. Are you palm muting slightly on a lot of that stuff in the back of the bridge? Or are you just hitting it st straight on? It, it, when it's needed, you know, like just the, the just here, you know, if, if uh, you just got to keep keep it contained. So I, I I do that, yeah. You know why I ask is because when guys come down, I do it with a lot of uh, celebrity musicians. When they come down at first, when they're playing it, they'll just be like do 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 and it's like fun and i'm like no no this there's a there's a slight mute in there you know like and then they get it but when they first come in they're just playing you know straight ahead bass it, it's funny with acdc like people think i got this and then they go to do it and they go what are these guys doing <laughs> yeah yeah it's a it's a little thing you get you know we've been doing it so damn long now you know so it's just second nature so after home breaks up your um basically you're thinking of retiring from bass in my, am I right? And then you get a call to check it out. Uh, I got together with a couple of players um, and we had a group called bandit for a short time. I did one album. We did one album together. The band went on after I left. Uh, that had a couple of interesting people in uh, Jim diamond, who is no longer with us. Unfortunately, a Scottish singer uh, and Jimmy Litherland, Litherland was in uh, Coliseum in the 60s, great guitar player. Uh, Graham Broad, who's been with <coughs> Roger Waters now for many years. Uh, and and we, we had that little noise for a while, then I got out, uh, and I was kind of like thinking, no, this is, you know, we've been banging on the door for 10 years now, maybe, maybe this is it. And then I got a, a call from Jimmy Litherland, actually, saying uh, he got word through, I think it was Muff Wimwood, uh, the, the boys were over looking for a bass player, and uh, I guess my name got thrown in the pot. Do you know how they uh, heard about you? Did they did they know about your work with Home or something? I don't think that – I don't know. You know, it's, it's interesting. It's been 40-plus years, and I never asked them that. <laughs> it's, it's actually, how the hell did you come up with my name? <laughs> well, yeah, I always wonder that. I mean, to me, the ACDC auditions are so um, – 
monumental and nobody talks about him. Like I was, I had a long conversation yesterday about who else did ACDC look at before Brian. Uh, you know what I'm saying? It's like there had to be other guys in there. And that's how I felt with uh, when you came in on base. Were there other guys? Uh, you know, what was the audition process like? Did you fly over to Australia? Is that how this happened? No, the guys were in London. Uh, I think, you know, with greatest respect to, to all Aussie bass players, the, the boys know, knew the pool of players to draw from there. And I, I think they wanted to uh, to just expand that and come over to England and look at uh, some some different bass players. So uh, I think they looked at a bunch, like a bunch. Uh, so um, I, I I went to play with them. I think four or five times. You know, uh, when you went in, was it? Did you learn ACDC songs, or how many songs did you play when you're in there? Was it like a couple songs each time? Yeah, um, what the first time around, um, I'd, I'd seen them on a TV show in England. Some I can't remember the top of the pops, or, no, it wouldn't have been that because they weren't a big success. In some TV show, anyway, and it, you know, it's like they look like they're having a lot of fun right there, you know. So, so I knew of them like that. I'd not really heard anything, any other music, so I just went up, went down, and you know, plugged in and, and played. Uh, and then the manager gave me, uh, a bunch of LPs to, to take home, and they were, you know, the big uh, to take home and listen to, which I did obviously, and came back for a second go around, uh, having a bit more ammunition, knowing a bit more of the style and the songs and so on. That's that's amazing. So four or five times, yeah. are, are, you, are you going crazy? Well, like what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> you got to be like, hey, dude, I think I nailed it on the third audition. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what what were your first impressions of Bond when you got in there? Was he a, a like a, a great dude, or was he a, what kind of guy was he? He's kind of, he was first go around. He was kind of quiet, uh, and you know because they didn't know me, I didn't know them, you know. But they were very friendly. Mal was super friendly and open. Phil was, was they were all friendly, you know. They were all friendly, but you know it takes a while to whew, relax and all that good stuff. So. So, but they were very open. It was, they were great. Do you remember if you, uh, what basin, did they have a rig there for you? Did you bring your rig? Was it like a fender was, and an amp I think was an amp, there, there was an amp there. I just came with my, with my bass at the time. I noticed that over the period of ACDC, you've played a, a, a bunch of different basses. You were playing a jazz bass for a while, then your P bass for a while, and then the Music Man stuff. Uh, what what was really your main bass back then? Did, did you just have one? The P bass was pretty much, I played that. I had the jazz bass for a little while. It was an old beat up thing. It was great, but it was real thin. It's a jazz bass, you know, so. Um, let's see what else. I tried, a, I tried some others. I tried a Thunderbird one time for a little while. Oh, yeah, on the back and black photo shoots you had that. Yeah, but I, it was not on the record. Um, I, I just, it's just a cool looking guitar, so I thought we'd try this. Mal had this big Gretsch white Falcon, and um, just yeah, we were going off a little bit there, <laughs> experimenting with the guitars. But uh, I had the P bass for the long, a uh, long time, and then uh, uh, George Malalang's brother, who was the band's producer at the time, uh, got a hold of one of these music bands and let me try it. And it was, you know, that's and that, you know, that was that's, and that's been my instrument ever since I bought my first one in 1979 so yeah yeah i mean that you are known as the music man it, it's funny i saw you in 78 oakland coliseum dan the green you oh, rocking, right. rocking the p bass man yeah. out there just an old p bass i was like and you had kind of like a uh, almost a hawaiian shirt on and i was like <laughs> yeah no it was cool though man it's it's uh -huh. almost punk rock like you guys come uh -huh. out like oh look at these guys <laughs> when you join ACDC, I guess it's right after the Let the Be Rock, and then you're getting ready to do Power Age. Is that right? I'm, I always wondered that exact timeline. Uh, um, Let, Let the Be Rock was recorded when I joined them. But, I know that. Um, but, and I toured first on that record, although I was not on it. Uh, and then we rolled into, so that was 77 uh, when I joined. Uh, 78 we did power so that was my first recording with them it's, it's unreal i mean 
the Sin City baseline is uh, so iconic with ACDC. It's 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 the epic baseline, man. What's that? Do? <laughs> yeah. When when you join and they're writing the Power Age record, which a lot of people consider the crown jewel of ACDC, are you? Are you going like, wow, these songs are great, and are they coming together pretty quick? What's that writing process like? Sure. Uh, I mean, in those days, we'd sit around in a room, and the guys would work on the songs. Uh, Mel and I have an idea for something, you know, or hanging out, have an idea, and they just sit there. And Mel would just sit with his guitar, and he, he, he'd close his eyes, and he'd, he'd go, and then he'd try this. And I like that, you know, so it was worked out on the spot. Um, and and Power Age is my favorite album because it's my first and all that, but there's some great songs on it. So it was a really uh, kind of a roots writing thing in those days. It was, the, the record was just so slamming. I mean, like kicked in the teeth again, that okay. kind of stuff. It's like, wow, this is a, I mean, that record is over the top. The album cover, the photo, everything about it, the tour. That's the first tour I see you guys on. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've got a semi hit, I would say, with Sin City. They're playing it on the radio. That's how I find out about you guys. Yeah. And, and then, you know, you guys are out touring. And I'm talking about uh, the Day on the Green, a Coliseum, but. I know other than that, it was a real grind out there, right? Kind of van stuff. Yeah, yeah. We 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 had a like a I don't know, rider van or something with a couple of couple of guys for our equipment. And we all used to travel around in a station wagon. Yeah. Uh fill a drive. Yeah. Fill with drive. Fill a drive, yeah. And uh with our guitars and suitcases, you know, five five of us in there. There might have sometimes been six with a tour manager. And we did like a couple of hundred miles a day, you know, it was just how it was. But we were, you know, 23 and 20, I was 27, 28 at the time. And I, you know, you're bulletproof and you're having a ball. Yeah. So that's all right. <laughs> I, I once heard that you guys pulled up to Day in the Green, which is the giant concert in Oakland, you know, Coliseum in the station wagon. And you got to the backstage gate and they're like, can we help you? And they're like, yeah, we're uh, playing today. And they're like, nah, they just saw the wagon and they're like, see you later. And you guys are like, no, we're playing today. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if it was that one, but what we did a couple of days on the green over the, over the uh, years. I think Angus did a, a radio interview on the fly when he was doing his solo in Let There Be Rock. He was he was playing away and doing an interview at the same time. It was really? Just, oh, yeah, yeah. It was great. I'm pretty sure, but you'd have to ask Gang, but I'm pretty sure that he did that. Wow. Of course, we're all on stage going, <laughs> where is he? <laughs> Fun days. What was it like when Mutt Lang comes in for Highway to Hell, uh, which is the next record you do, uh, right away, we're, to me, this is this is my record that I, I mean, I love them all, but this one really sonically and everything was just another level. What what was that like? Because he was fairly, he wasn't the Mutt Lang of three records later in the Def Leppard era and all that. Right. So what was he like at that time? He was great. He was just real down to earth. Um, it, it, just a different you know, we'd had George and Harry for so long, so this was something new for us. And uh, uh, he was very easy to work with. Yeah, he got lots of lots of good uh, input. Uh, I, you know, I've not seen him for years, but he's he was been like he's been like that. You know, I'm sure he's the same guy now. You know, he's just like pretty down to earth and all that good stuff. So uh, and some some different, as you say, sonically some different sounds. The engineer. Uh, um, oh God, I can't think of his name. I'm sorry. Uh, he was, he and Mark worked together with on three records, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, the guy that did, uh, yeah, Back in Black and those yeah, about and, to, yeah, uh, right, those, right, yeah. When, when you guys uh start Highway to Hell, though, you start with a different producer and then can that, right? Yeah, who was yeah. that? He, I can't remember. Uh, uh oh, what's his name, Eddie, Eddie Kramer. Thank you. But I, that didn't pan out. It just, we just it didn't have a meeting of the minds on that one, which is, it happens. So we just moved on. 
And, and was Mutt suggested by someone or because I don't remember him. Uh, I, maybe he did four and or four by no, no, four and a four is after. So I don't know what he did before Highway to Hell. Yeah. Um, my memory is vague on it. I know he'd, he'd done a couple of bands, but nothing that really, you know, left out or anything. And what studio was that done at? Can't remember. <laughs> I love you. I'm just, cause as we're talking, I'm trying to think, damn, come on, what's Highway to Hell? Where were we? <laughs> Can't remember. <laughs> That is so great. That's how it should be. <laughs> blanks in my career. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, I always had a question about this because I think that the film Let There Be Rock is one of the greatest uh, live music films ever. It just for so many reasons, but for a lot of it, like the cinematography and the way that it was shot and the color of it, it's kind of almost like Godfather. It's got these ambers in there and it's just beautifully uh, shot. What was the idea on this? Um, who came up with it? Who paid for it? Was it the record company that said, let's do a film? Uh, pro probably the record company at the time. I would yeah. think. Yeah. I was just wondering because it was weird how it came out. It, it came out like, you know, shown in movie theaters and then it just kind of went away for a long time until the VHS tape came around. Yeah, I, I guess. Yeah. I'm trying to think on it must've been the record company because we didn't have any money in those days. So, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it had a little bit of a noise and then, uh, disappeared. So yeah. Yeah. I don't know why. Yeah. It's fantastic, man. Do you remember uh, those sh that show that they shot? Because it's pretty damn electric, that show. I'd have to go back and look at it again, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you've played, what, a couple thousand gigs with ACDC? Yeah. <laughs> those little gigs are fantastic. Well, little, not so little. Fantastic shows. You know, like Hammersmith Odeon and stuff like that. A couple of thousand seasons. The Rose Bowl. It's gone now, and uh, Rose Bowl, Rose Roseland Ballroom. Oh yeah, in New York. Excuse me. They, they tore the building down there, but what an awesome little venue. Yeah, that place, place, magic, right? Yeah. When you were in the band, uh, now that you're up in Highway to Hell, you've been in the band quite a, a bit now. Who were you hanging with a lot? Was it Bon or or who was your guy, Phil? Phil, Phil and I were tight. I, I, I roomed with Bond for a while because we didn't have our own rooms. And then uh, Phil and I hung out, room together, and he and I were, were pretty tight. You know, we got into the photography thing. We each had a little camera. We'd get up and take pictures. And in the uh, the holiday and dark, uh, bathroom, we'd use it, make a dark room out of it and do all our own stuff. Yeah. So Phil and I were tight. Wow, you got like photos of the tour, like out on tour. But old, old black and white pictures. Uh, got them today, sure. Oh, you got those still? Yeah. yeah. Oh, you got to put a book out. But it's nah. It's a, it, but it's 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 like I mean I was a terrible photographer. I wouldn't want anyone to see them. But for the, the memory, it's great, you know. And uh, but a lot of it was like through a, through a window, a tour bus window, oh, yeah. snapping things and just backstage and uh, you know, so it was a. There's no, trust me there's no book coming out but again good 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 stuff to see for me well acdc anything acdc history wise you know hey here's a bad photo of him in a tour bus people go crazy for that stuff <laughs> well, you know <laughs> let's uh let's talk a little bit about uh your thoughts of uh when they're auditioning singers uh once bond is gone uh, I talked to Angus uh, about how this went down. They said that he said him and Malcolm would be at the studio and guys would come in. They just played the two guys on a guitar and filter through them that way. And then uh, if a guy made it past that, then the band would come down. Do you remember it like that? I, I'm sure if, Angus, if, if that's what it was, then that's what it was. I, can, I just remember when the band was all together. Uh, and they they probably weeded a few people out at that point. Yeah. Do you remember any of the other guys that sang or what they were like? Or, um, yeah, there was one guy I remember. He's he's gone now as well. Uh, what was he? Damn, I can't think of his name. A London boy, black hair. Uh, there were a couple. 
uh, that um, I, I don't I don't recall names. I'm sorry, Dean. Oh, that's uh, all right. Uh, what about styles of the guys? Were they? They were, were all they... kind of in the in the rock area. I mean, they had to be, I guess, you know. So, uh, uh, but we were excited about Brian coming down. Yeah, couldn't find it for the for the longest time. We were sitting around in the in the, in the playroom, uh, and uh, it was. You know, where's, where's Brian Johnson? He was downstairs playing pool with the crew guys. He didn't know. He'd just come in, and I, I guess they didn't. I don't know how it happened. But we were hanging around. He's down there playing a game of pool with, with, the, with our road crew. <laughs> he, he came He came up, and I think the first thing we did was uh, Nutbush City Limit. Yeah. Uh, and then went on from there, you know. But he, was, he is a bundle of fun. So. Oh, my God. I mean – that that early uh brian johnson vocals of those first three are so radical you had to be just going like whoa this guy is going for it you know you get into that it's it's got a texture and a grit and then the, the how high it is vocally it's pretty wild yeah yeah he really nailed it on that uh, back of black album with some awesome stuff on I'm a big fan of uh, Flick of the Switch. A lot of people don't talk about this record, and I think it's absolutely fantastic. It's uh, stripped down after the Mutt Lang stuff, but uh, I think the tunes are, are amazing, and that tour was fantastic. Oh, bless you. Well, that was our – I think what happened, you know, Mutt was um, – uh, has his sound, and it was starting to get on to ACDC. And you know, like Def Leppard, you know, we just didn't want that to happen. We needed to keep the ACDC thing like it should be, you know, like it was. Uh, so that's why the guys, Mel and I, decided to, to, to move on from Mark and uh, do it themselves. So, but thank you. I'm glad you like it. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> no. I mean, look, let's be honest. If anybody else put out Flick of the Switch, it'd be their greatest record of all time. But of course it comes after back in black. And, uh, and I, I love for those about to rock also just as much as back in black, if not more. Uh, and then this flick of the switch, especially if you listen to it years later, like you get away from the behemoth of back in black and, and that whole thing. And you listen to it later, you go, Whoa, man, this thing's great. I've got to go back and listen to it. I've not heard it for years. Oh, God. I, I, for real, man. It's got a real raw, almost a let there be rock type of raw going for it, you know? Now, when you're in the studio, uh, how do you guys track? Is it usually you and Phil just live going for it with uh, no, Malcolm? We'll the, the whole band will play. Uh, and we'll do it uh, until it doesn't hurt, you know. Uh, and then, uh, uh, so we've got a good drum track here, you know? and then some maybe guitar's good, it's fine, and but then we have the option of going back and uh, fixing it up. So we'll start off all of us playing together, and we do that with all the tracks. And do, do you uh, do anything like double the bass or or anything like no. that, or is it just straight bass? Just straight bass. And then SVT at base rigs, or what do you, what do you, yeah, SVT typically. Um, on Back in Black, I used a, a turnover top, uh, Portaflex. Oh, wow, really? Uh, and a 410 cabinet and a couple of DIs mixed together. Yeah. Wow, a turnover top. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> the bass tone on that record is unbelievable. Yeah, it's mixed. I mean, the turnover top's in there. But yeah. you know, you've got some other stuff going on to create the, the sound. I think one of the greatest things visually about this band live is the walk up for the background vocals and the walk back. How does this come about and how long do you guys practice this? You never mess it up. It's exactly well, it, perfect. Uh, we didn't. That, that came up just, just doing it. I mean, basically what you're doing is trying to keep out of Angus and Brian's way. Right. So, and they know when we're, we have to be there and when we don't have to be there. And we, we're we just trying to go do the bit and get the hell out of there you know, to leave the stage open. So that's all that was. It was never uh, thought about or anything. It just happened like that. God, it's perfect. And it's the ultimate look. Here comes the backgrounds, you know. 
and just the perfect walk up, sing them, then go back to the amp and just crush it rhythmically. <laughs> I love it. I'm fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, uh, when you came in, that had to be a big, uh, big part of the audition was being able to sing the backgrounds because that's a massive thing in ACDC. And it's only you and Malcolm singing backgrounds. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess I, I did all right. And, uh, uh, you know, be, in this in recording, we'll double those, obviously. Yeah, of course. Picking them up. I could hold a tune a little bit. <laughs> Were you singing before that, or you just were going for? Yeah, it? I always was, would sing, ne never a lead singer. I was always just be uh, choruses. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the differences. Of course, once Phil leaves, Simon Wright comes in later. Chris Slade, uh, both those guys, fantastic drummers, but totally different feels. Right. What was that like for you? And did you guys audition a bunch of guys? once phil was gone for the before simon got it were you looking at guys because you know it's a big thing for a bass player they got to be able to feel it yeah really and it was a big thing uh what we what we did was in rehearsals again in london um we'd have uh dickie jones uh drummer only feels guy would have a kit set up in a room and he would get the people in and they would play along to a record and if he thought that this was an opportunity, a, a possibility, he would send them through to us. And that's how that was fed in. And uh, so we auditioned a few guys. Simon knew all the songs, which was really helpful. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, uh, so we're not, you know, we weren't in there for months and months trying to find the right uh, guy, you know. And Simon did fine. Uh, it's uh, very difficult. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, Malcolm and Phil and I, were, as a rhythm section, had really just gotten it, gotten solid. You know, we were we we loved to play with each other. It was a great time. So that was a biggie when Phil stood out for uh, stepped out for a while, and then Chris came in. The same thing with Chris. Uh, I don't, I can't remember where the hell we were. We auditioned not in London, somewhere else. Uh, but great drummer, great drummer. But Phil has the swing dude he's the secret sauce i call it of acdc yeah there's something to phil isn't it wild like when you think about it like uh i i really really noticed it on the uh rocker bus tour because slade was back there again and slade definitely plays it his way but as soon as uh phil's in that chair there's that swing and there's it, th there's a thing where he doesn't play anything that doesn't need to be played. Right. Yeah. He, he's just, uh, you, you said it, you know, it's the, he, he just swings like a mother and it's not all this stuff. It might've been Eddie Kramer that tried to get Phil to get, do a few fills, Phil, you know, to, to get a little fancy. And I think Phil's comment was, uh, you got the wrong drummer. So, you know, that's, that's Phil. <laughs> I love Phil, man. He is the outlaw back there with the cigarette and the glasses on on the uh, Black Ice tour. Oh my God, he just looks so great, man. He's and then in Let There Be Rock when he's got the Porsche 928 just cruising it out on the ice. He's a gearhead. Oh, well, Brian is also a gearhead too. So yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, toward, towards the end of uh, the Rocker Bus Tour, we all know what happened. It's, it's just kind of uh, Brian has the hearing problem, and then Axel comes in, and you decide to step away. Um, was that a, uh, a, a thing of if Brian's not here, and you guys are pretty tight, I know, was it that of like, this is, this is run its course? It was before then. I'd, I'd spoken to Angus about it initially, I, I was at a point, this is at the beginning of the Rockwell Bus Tour, that I just felt that for me, it was time to hang it up. Um, I didn't, I knew that I didn't want to keep doing these two year tours um, and I didn't want to hold them back. So I, I made them aware of the fact that this was going to be my last uh, go round. Um, it was a tough tour to finish. 
Um, God bless Axel for coming in and helping us out, uh, finish it up. Uh, he did a great job. Uh, and uh, at the end of that, it was, I was definitely, that was it for me, done, just done. Uh, that, like, that compounded the whole thing. Um, and I, the reason I came back, you, you know, if, if, if Back in Black has Bond Scott, Scott all over it, uh, for me, uh, Power Up has got Malcolm Young. Oh, this is for him, and 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 it's it's all it's all the almost it's the band that that we put, that we play together with for forty plus years. I mean, I, I wanted to do that. I wanted to come back and do that. And at the end of the we we did some rehearsals earlier this year before this darn COVID thing popped up, uh, and we 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 had great rehearsals. The band was playing really well, uh, so we. You want to do a few shows? Sure, a few shows, uh, and that was that. That was the last. We, we were planning on doing that. Everyone goes home to their respective homes, and bang, we've been here ever since. So you, the plan, your commitment was a few shows, not a two-year world tour. Right. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's just, you know, uh, for, for for my health. You know, we've all we all have our issues down the line, you know. So, but just for me, I just can't do that. Anymore. Was it your mental health or physical? I did both of it. For real, I definitely have, I have some uh, physical issues, which I won't bore you with the details of. It. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's just um, it's tough, you know. So uh, I'm very grateful for everything. You know, it's been fantastic, but I just don't want to do that anymore. Was there any? Um thought of at the rehearsals of just mid set playing the whole back in black since it was the 40 year anniversary never came up wow no wow you mean playing the whole all the tracks through correct yeah yeah never came up interesting thought though oh god yeah i mean it's 40 year anniversary of the second biggest record ever made i was really thinking there was going to be some type of back in black tour you know uh, of course you got the new record which is fantastic so you, have you heard the whole thing i got the whole thing man it's great oh, it's great. great i uh i really love the new record actually i think i also love rocker bust a lot um i think that these two records at this deep in the career and to be this rocking still is fantastic, you know? Thanks, man. Absolutely. Stuff like Code Red mm. and, and the opening track, Realize, uh, the more I hear that, the more it gets crazy stuck in my head. And then you've got that classic ACDC old school riffing on Demon Fire, you know? Yeah, that's the song. When, yeah. You know, when you're an ACDC head like me, you need that, -nah 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 -nah, that kind of stuff, you know, you know, like shake a leg back in black, um, uh, beating around the bush, those kind of, -nah 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 -nah, you know, that kind of stuff that, that no one could do. Uh -huh. Cool stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so good, man. So, okay, so the record's coming out November 13th. Um, I did read some places uh, where the, kind of at Malcolm's funeral, all the guys were there, and it was like, hey, uh, you want to get together and maybe, you know, dig into these tracks that are uh, left over from Black Ice and stuff. Uh, is that how it went down for you, or was it a call later? It was a call later. Um, it was a an email I got, uh, hey, the guys are thinking of doing this. I just want to do this. Are you on, on board or not? And then w did he tell you the, the idea was to go through the guitars, uh, the, the song ideas, and then uh, meet up in Vancouver? Uh, I, I knew that's what he was doing. I mean, the Mal and Angus have a pool of material, or ideas, riffs, and loads of stuff. Uh, that, that he draws from, did it with Rock or Bust as well. So uh, that that will, will be the natural course of events. And were you surprised uh, on the the 
spy shots, photos of the oh, studio? I, I that. There was someone across the road from the studio in Vancouver snapping shots of the boys outside smoking cigarettes yeah. and drinking tea. And I don't smoke cigarettes anymore, so I never went out there. It was just that I never got my snap, but that was kind of a ah, bit of fun. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I mean, that was big news, man. That is big news because <laughs> for years people are like, well, it's, it's probably done. Who knows, you know? And uh, pretty wild. When you went up there, how fast did, uh, was the record made? Did you track for a couple weeks? Uh, it, it was done in about six six weeks or so. Uh, Brendan Brendan O'Brien, our producer of the last three now, he works. He keeps it going. He's really good. He, he keeps it fresh. Doesn't let you sit around and you know drink tea and smoke cigarettes and that's all you do. You know. You, but uh, uh, it, it rolled really quickly. It rolled really well. And with that that studio, we love that place. It's a great playroom because the one wall is all kind of glass. So you don't feel enclosed. You're not in a, in a dungeon of a, of a studio. Uh, and uh, the sound comes off, comes back at you just how you put it in. You know, see so the acoustics of the place is really good. Yeah, it's funny because Brendan has his own studio in Atlanta. And I was always wondering why you guys weren't in there. Yeah, we never tried it. I'm, I'm sure he loves it, but uh, uh, he, he's happy to work with us in Vancouver. And we just really like that. That's great. Now, you uh, have set some time with the record now. What songs stick out for you? What do you like? Well, it depends what day it is. <laughs> uh, you know, what you said, uh, um, Mr. Time is really different. It's so different, uh, right? Yeah, uh, I kind of, uh, but I like uh, Demon Fire and Wild Reputation, uh, are two tracks that I really enjoy. But then I'll go and I'll listen to another one and go, oh, this is awesome. What's uh what's your life like these days? Um, what do you like to do? Uh, well, we're up here in the mountains. Uh, it's beautiful. Um, I've got a group of friends here that we go and you know flip burgers and drink beer and all that good stuff. Uh, I just, I go sport and clay shooting. I like that. That's my hobby now. And that's it. I mean, pretty much. You know, what do we all do anymore? I mean, you're. You're out, you're out there, out here, you know, so yeah. that's great. Yeah. I just, I'm the, I'm the same way. I'm, I'm a comedian and uh, I have no work anymore. To get this behind us, this is bullshit. This is you know, crazy. It yeah. is crazy. Where, where are you, Ben? I'm in Los Angeles. Okay, gotcha. My daughter used to live there. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah, she's out of there now, but yeah, cool. It's kind of at this point now where you can kind of live anywhere or doing this type of stuff now uh, with Zoom and everything. So I'm just trying to figure out really what I would, uh, where else I would live. Um, I always wondered why you picked Florida and a lot of the people from the UK pick Florida. It's the heat. You like the warmth. Yeah, there's the, certainly that's attractive. Although in the summertime, it's brutal, as you know. Um, for me, it was a, uh, well, Brian was there, uh, Johnson. Um, so that was, we were moving from where we were. We, uh, my wife and I both enjoy the water, a little bit of boating and stuff like that, and a nice climate. Also, in those days, it was a good central point for touring. Yeah, you, know, you get to Europe easy, you get to North America, Canada, or whatever, South America. It was a good central point, so it made sense and uh, no, I, 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 I would say to my wife, I'm not going to Florida and growing old. Too late. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we've been there a long time now. Got good, good old buddies there, you know. So that works. Which part are you at? Uh, what- We're on the on the Gulf Coast uh, right. in a town called Fort Myers. Oh, right on. Yeah. Give me before we get out of here. Do you have one great Bon Scott story? That that maybe nobody knows a great one. I, I don't. I'd have to sit and think, so I don't have a great story. What I one of my memories of of Bon uh, when I was rooming with him would be you'd hear like breaking glass and this cackle of a laugh, uh, and I just thought because he he'd be on his bed, I'd be on mine, we'd be doing that Jack and Coke and stuff like, that. and he'd just go. And chuck the glass at it and smash all over the wall. He'd spin the TVs. Remember in the old days, those TV sets on a post, 
He'd spin the shit out of that stuff. And it's just stuff like that. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I, I can't thank you enough for uh, talking to me. And uh, I'm really happy that this Back in Black core um, made this record uh, power up, man. It's it's I think we more than ever right now need it. And this is like some good news in this horrible year. It's the it's the the crown jewel of 2020. Wow, bless you. Thank you, Dean. And uh, we just hope we can get out and do play those few shows, whatever it is that we can get to. Thank you. Yeah, I hope so too. And I and I want to thank you from the uh, bottom of my heart, man, for just rocking it up there. One of the best rock and roll bass players ever. Just up there laying it down. You, Malcolm, and and Phil Rudd. I've never seen anything like that as far as you want to talk about locked. That is the definition. When you open up the dictionary, it's the three of you sitting there. <laughs> yeah, I need the definition of locked. There it is. Bless you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you so much, man. And uh, I wish you uh, great health and keep rocking. I hope to uh, meet you one day in person. Let's do that. Thank you. Thank Bye you, brother. Now. I'll see you later, man. Yeah. See ya.